Now, since this is a course in linear programming, which I guess we covered in the first lecture, it shouldn't surprise you to learn that we're going to spend pretty much the whole semester talking about linear programs. Here's a linear program here. And we're going to spend most of the beginning of the semester, maybe 60% of it, talking about if I hand you one of these linear programs, how do we solve it? How do we get to the point of knowing what the answer is? And we'll see that there are some cases where there is no answer, but we at least want to know that fact. And then we're going to jump into a bunch of different applications, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how to take some applied problem that we end up with and transform it into a linear program. Because often it happens that we're working with some practical problem, and we end up wanting to optimize some quantity that isn't linear. And we'll see that we sort of have to bend over backwards to turn that into something linear and maybe sacrifice something along the way. So give up some accuracy or end up with a couple of special cases that we have to handle. And so I think that before we can dive into to solving linear programs and talking about those, I have some work to do to talk you into it. I have to convince you that focusing only on linear programs is actually worthwhile, that we're not giving up too much. And the goal of this lecture is to start from nothing, basically, to start from making no assumptions and to begin to make the case that if we don't restrict ourselves to something pretty strict, maybe a linear program, maybe something a little bit less strict than that, then we're going to end up in a lot of trouble. And that optimization in general is a really hard problem to solve. One of the most important reasons I think I should make that case now in 2021 is that this course, so CSC 445, has existed for forever as far as I'm concerned. So since long before I was born, there was a course at UVic on linear programming. And that predated the, the availability of personal computers and things. And it certainly predated the availability of um, scientific computing packages like SciPy. And if you ever encounter some optimization problem, linear or nonlinear, and you haven't taken a course like this, you might look up how to solve it in code and you might get a reference to SciPy, which has solvers that can help you with optimization of linear and nonlinear things. And so if you've already seen that sort of thing, maybe you're a bit skeptical about this idea that we should be focusing on linear optimization. You think, well, wait, we can optimize just about anything with these toolkits. Shouldn't we be learning about how those work? And I mean, the, sh the short explanation of why not is that the course is only one semester long. Um, but it's also that it turns out that despite the fact that it looks like SciPy and other toolkits are sort of magic, and they can do this optimization, it's hard. And they often can't get very good results. So just at the beginning here, because we're going to start by talking about nonlinear things, let's remind ourselves what it means for something to be a linear program. So I've drawn this linear program out on the slide. We have our objective function, and then we have down here a set of constraints. And I've decided for the sake of this linear program that my two optimization variables, which you might, heard, uh, you might hear called decision variables, are going to be x and y. And of course, maybe you believe me if I tell you that I could have as many optimization variables as I want and I can call them anything that I want. Notice that if I think about just x and y, in terms of x and y, every single function that I'm working with is a linear function. It's a bunch of constants multiplied by uh, x and y added together or subtracted. And it's worth considering something that will come up a lot later. There's nothing inherently wrong with using nonlinear things in this expression of a linear program, as long as with respect to the optimization variables, everything is still linear. So an example would be, you might see a linear program written out like this. Minimize th 3 times x plus 5 squared times y. Okay, well, we shouldn't be having squares in linear functions, should we? Well, the issue here is that 5 squared is just a constant. It doesn't affect y. y is still, being, is still participating in a linear function here. It, it's a bit weird to write it this way. I'm really just writing the number 25 with strange notation. But we will notice as the semester goes on that often we end up designing linear programs that involve nonlinear or, or constants that are derived by nonlinear means. So we might see something like root 17 over here. And that's fine, because as long as the optimization variables are only involved in linear uh, combinations, then we're good. So the case that I want to make is, why is it so hard to, you know, optimize things like this? Minimize 3x squared plus 5y squared. Minimize square root of that. Maybe I throw in a trigonometric function, or I use e, or something like that. Uh, I want to make the case 
at a high level for why that can be a nightmare, why general optimization is a problem. I guess I have a slide that tries to explain this a little bit. We're going to spend a lot of time in this course trying to find ways of taking a problem that's shown up in practice, which could be a bit ugly, and cramming it into some linear setting. In some cases, that requires making a sacrifice. We sacrifice accuracy. We sacrifice something else. Um, and Obviously, if I just started with that, a lot of people watching this would think, what's, what's the point of this? Why are we wasting all this time on this tedious transformation if we could just do the optimization in a nonlinear setting? Especially if you've seen other settings where nonlinear optimization is used, for example, in machine learning. Um, so I need to make the case. And so this lecture is about that. This lecture is going to be a survey of a whole bunch of different stuff. Some of it is going to be review for you. Some of it isn't. A lot of this will factor back into the course at some point in the semester. But as far as this lecture is concerned, I wouldn't say very much of it's going to appear on assignment one. We're really just sort of laying a foundation that we can refer back to later. And the reason I bring that up now is that there will be a few places, depending on your background, where some notation you've never seen before just randomly appears. So don't panic if that happens. If we need that notation for the course, we will return to it in a live session or in some future uh, uh, video lecture. OK, first, this is a problem that might uh, ring a bell from something like Math 100 or Math 109. Um, this often comes up in the setting of calculus. We'll see in a minute this because calculus is a really easy way of approaching a problem like this. What I would like to do is I've got a function of one variable, so a function in one unknown x. And I want to find the minimum value that that function attains anywhere on the real line. So I'm doing what's called global unconstrained minimization. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to bounce back and forth. I'm mostly going to talk about things like minimization problems. But um, it's worth convincing yourself that minimization and maximization are basically the same thing. If I ask you a question like, could you minimize the function f of x? It's not really that much different than asking you a question like, could you maximize the negative of f of x? So there isn't usually any real difference between minimization and maximization, um, except for some minor semantic interpretation thing. The, the techniques I would use are about the same both ways. One thing we'll notice that's a real problem for us is this word, global minimum. It's one thing to find a place where f appears to stop decreasing. So an example would be, I could graph out f around the point x equals 0. And if I just do a sketch of the graph, I notice, well, yeah, OK, there's a point down here where f seems to hit its low. But what I asked for was the global minimum, which means it's not sufficient to just say, OK, yeah, this is where f seems to bottom out. I also have some argument that I have to make that at no other place on the real line does f attain a lower value. And as we know, we shouldn't just trust a graph like this. We don't know whether off the edge of the plot, f does something like this. And when I ask for a global minimum, I need you to assert not only that what you found is a minimum, so I'm stuck at the bottom of this trough, but it's the absolute lowest f ever gets. And that's actually pretty tough. It's even sort of tough when we're working with the relatively well-behaved function that I've given here. It's continuous. It's differentiable. It's a polynomial. Polynomial. Polynomials are generally sort of on the friendly side for functions of real numbers. And we might remember from Math 100 or 109 that one of the ways we can uh, approach this problem is by looking for what are called inflection points. And that are th those are places where that are candidates to be a minimum or maximum. Um, and I, I'm only going to just skim over the theory behind this here because it should be review for all of you. But essentially, if I'm looking at this point down here, this minimum that I, I expect should exist at the bottom of the trough, what I'm expecting is there is a point, so f keeps change, the, the rate of change of f is generally negative over here, and it's generally positive over here, which means there has to be some point in the middle where f stops decreasing and starts increasing. In general, there has to be a point where the derivative, which of course is a measurement of the rate of change of the function, where the derivative hits 0. Uh, we know this because if the derivative is continuous and we see it's negative here and positive here, there has to be a point in the middle where it hits 0, where it turns around. And so that's the argument that's made in Math 100 or 109 for using derivatives to find the minimum, uh, the minimum and maximum values of functions. It turns out, though, uh, I don't actually need the second derivative here, but maybe you can satisfy yourself that I can take as many layers of derivative as I need of a function that's this well behaved. 
it turns out that all I need for this example is the first derivative. So I, I look for places where the derivative equals zero. Now there are a lot of reasons a derivative can equal zero. So another reason a derivative can equal zero is in a situation like this. This is a bit, that was a bit shaky, but I'm still getting back my screen drawing ability. Um, somewhere in this function here, there is a point where the derivative hits zero, but it's not actually a minimum. It's just a place where the function is, the, the growth rate of the function is changing in such a way that coincidentally it hits zero. Uh, however, it does turn out to be the case that in a function like this, all of the minimum and maximum values I expect to see will happen at these inflection points. So if I want to find the minimum and maximum values of the function, what I can do is find the inflection points, find the places where the derivative equals zero, and then just look at them and decide if any of them are a minimum or maximum. So in this case, I say, well, I want the derivative to equal zero. So that means I'm saying something like set this value to zero. And conveniently, this is actually a linear function. Maybe this is already setting the stage for why linear functions are sort of helpful. I want to find a value of x such that this equation is satisfied. And so I end up with 12x equals negative 10 or x equals negative 10 over 12. It's worth observing that this is the only value of x that does that. Because the derivative f prime of x is a linear function, there, it, there isn't going to be some issue where there's like 20 different values of x that could satisfy it. If there were squares or square roots or exponential functions or trigonometry in the derivative, that could result in all sorts of weird behavior. But it's a linear function. It turns out this is the only inflection point I can expect to exist. And that's going to actually, that's going to help us quite a bit um, because that means if every minimum or maximum has to occur at an inflection point, and this is the only inflection point, that does a little bit of my work for me for proving that this is truly the minimum. So I look at this inflection point and I verify, I mean, we can do it with this graph, although that doesn't prove anything. I verify that that inflection point is a minimum, so it's not a maximum or a saddle point. And then I have to establish that there is no value of f that is lower. And the difficulty there is that, sure, there might not be any other minimum or maximum, but how do I know that f doesn't go down to negative infinity? Because obviously, if it did, clearly this thing would not be a minimum. Um, in this case, the answer I could come up with informally is we know that f is increasing both directions away from the minimum that I found. If f is then later going to turn around and go down to negative infinity, there has to be a peak where it turns around. And that will be an inflection point. If I know that there are no other inflection points, then that peak can't exist. And so it turns out that finding this one inflection point is enough in this example to demonstrate that this thing, x equals negative 10 over 12, is a local minimum and, in fact, the global minimum of f. But hopefully you, you can understand from the way I had to describe it that answering that question of whether it was a global minimum or not was not easy. It, it, it's easy enough to say there's an inflection point. This is a local minimum. The function is definitely larger. It takes on larger values in both directions around this inflection point. But it's pretty hard to, uh, to assert that what we have is a global minimum. We have to make some semantic argument. And um, that's not really a, a practical thing to do if I'm solving huge numbers of different optimization problems, or if the optimization problems have a thousand variables. It's also worth considering, this is mostly a thought experiment, that if I didn't want to make that semantic argument about the function changing direction and scribbling all over a graph, it's actually surprisingly hard without calculus or something else to prove that that point is truly the global minimum. So I actually thought about this a bit and I realized one way we could do it is you can rewrite f by rearranging terms so that it looks like this. So that f for any value x is equal to f at our minimum plus six times something squared. And because maybe we can agree that something squared, and if it's a real number, is always going to be positive or zero, then that means this term here will only ever increase from the value of f of uh, negative 10 over 12, which means that uh, f of negative 10 over 12 has to be the minimum value of f across all x. But that's messy. We don't want to have to do that in general. What we're going to see over this lecture is that one of the difficulties we have isn't just that our functions tend to be maybe behave badly, but that it's actually very hard to get certainty. Even if our functions are uh, friendly and helpful, like this polynomial, so I mean f of x is a pretty friendly function here. It's, it's almost linear. It's quadratic plus some linear stuff. Um, even in that case, we have this difficulty of having certainty. We find something that we think is our minimum, but it's very hard to prove it, to demonstrate that yes, it definitely is the minimum that I want. There is nothing lower hiding a little bit out of range.
And then we've got this. So here's a function that's a little bit less friendly. And I should observe, it isn't that much less friendly. It's a polynomial with one trigonometric function thrown in to mess things up. And the reason that I bring this up is if we take a look, this is only, a, of course, a snippet. The function is, looks very interesting across the whole real line, but this snippet, I think, illustrates the problem that we're going to have, which is that you might argue, okay, the difficulty of proving something to be a global minimum is one thing, but if you hand me a polynomial, I could always write a computer program that just finds every inflection point, every point where the derivative equals zero, and just chooses the one that's the minimum. What about a case where the function has a huge number of inflection points? So this function keeps changing direction. Maybe you believe that because of that sine function stuck inside the function here, because of that sine function, this function is going to have an infinite number of inflection points. So if you write a computer program, even if it is able to take the derivative of a function, which is not always easy, even if it can do that and it can set the derivative to zero and solve that equation, which is also not always easy, it's pretty hard to solve nonlinear equations, even if it can do that, you end up with an infinite number of inflection points. How are you going to iterate through an infinite number of things? And that's one of our other difficulties. If we don't put restrictions on our functions, we end up in cases where we have an infinite set to iterate over, which we obviously don't want to do. And maybe it's true, there are algorithms that can find the minimum of functions like this, but they tend to be specialized. They tend to be designed for a specific class of function because the technique you use to work around that infinite set, that special case, can differ depending on what kind of function you're working with. So even if we have an algorithm to find the inflection points, and we just say, let's look at all the local minima and then choose the smallest one to be the global one, even then we're in trouble here because there are an infinite number of local minima. So, okay, we're at the end of part one here. The issue I think I've been able to establish is that global unconstrained optimization, even of a function with one variable, and I should add that these functions we just looked at are actually still pretty friendly. So f of x in both of our examples was a continuous function which had a derivative that existed everywhere. So even then, keeping in mind that lots of functions in practice don't have that property, even then we're in a bit of trouble if we want to do unconstrained optimization of an arbitrary function with no restrictions. And the problem is that, that what we tend to work with in practice, first off, is not going to have a single variable. It could have thousands of them, but also the function might not be as well behaved. So let's talk about the, the uh, broad, unconstrained optimization problem, the most general version. I want to minimize over all, all, all choices of x the value of f of x. And I don't give any other criteria that f has to obey. f is an arbitrary function. In fact, uh, I'm not even going to say what values of x apply. I might normally write something like this. Minimize over all x that are real numbers. Here, I'm, I'm hedging even on that. Because what if f d isn't defined for all real numbers? What if the domain of f is some subset of the real numbers? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the carte blanche um, unconstrained optimization problem uh, of a function f. Here are the outcomes I think could happen. Outcome one, we end up with uh, the minimum occurring at some inflection point, a place where the derivative of f is zero. Okay, so we've seen already that there are, at least there's a path to get that answer if we end up in that situation. Option two, what if the, the derivative of f doesn't exist everywhere? or if it has a discontinuity. And I'll give an example of that in a minute. But one, one example you can put in your head is, what if we have this situation here? f of x equals absolute value of x. Then the graph of f looks like this. The function f is actually continuous. Um, the difficulty is the derivative doesn't exist down here at the bottom of this v shape which of course is the minimum, which is a big deal. Um, and so it could be that my function isn't very well behaved and its derivative doesn't always exist. But if the function exists, any value for which the function is defined could be my minimum. So I could end up in case two, where the minimum occurs where the derivative can't be used to help me. That's a bit of a tough one, because if the derivative doesn't exist, I can't use some, uh, I can't just solve equations. I can't just say set the derivative to zero or something. I have to go looking for all the places where the derivative doesn't exist and process those separately. Then there's case three. Case three is a bit of a downer, but it's something that we have to put up with, even with linear programs. Um, and it's the case where there is no answer to the question. When you ask me, what is the minimum of f? Uh, 
And the answer is, I'm afraid there is no minimum of f because f gets arbitrarily small. So we call this a, a situation where it's unbounded. If f goes down to negative infinity, then there is no answer to the question, what is the minimum? Now that's not, a, I mean, that's not ideal, but that's something we can put up with. That's going to happen. It turns out that could even happen for linear programs. And this is, I think, one of the friendlier outcomes. Uh, and this one is something, again, where the minimum occurs at an inflection point. At least we have some way of closing in on that. At least we have some condition that holds. And then case number four, which is a strange one, where what if f of x is bounded below, so it doesn't go to negative infinity, but for some reason there is no minimum value. And one example of that would be consider the function um, e to the x where the graph of e to the x, and I don't know if my, uh, my screen drawing skills are up to snuff here, but the graph of e to the x looks sort of like this, where it just tapers off. It never actually hits the x-axis. Um, and therefore, it doesn't actually attain the minimum, which is 0. It asymptotically approaches 0 if we go over to the left, but it never actually hits 0. So if you choose any non-zero value, the function will at some point attain that value, but it will never actually attain the value 0, so there is no real minimum. This is sort of, case number 4 is sort of ugly, and we would really rather avoid being in that situation because it requires us to have some understanding of limits and asymptotic stuff, which in a practical optimization problem usually isn't really a big deal. So we'd like it if we could avoid that. And I've got some examples of these. The first one is something that uh, we've already seen, which is uh, if the minimum occurs at an inflection point, like our earlier example, um, then we just find all the inflection points and hopefully look at all of them or something. And of course, um, there's nothing precluding the function from having multiple inflection points or indeed from having the global minimum be attained in multiple places. So it's valid to have a function that looks like this, where the same global minimum uh, is attained in two completely distinct places. That's fine. But if it occurs at an inflection point, we at least have a path to find the inflection point. Case number two. So case number two is, what if we want to use our derivative criteria, but the function's derivative isn't well behaved? And this, uh, I think the absolute value function is the best example of that. So the absolute value function, again, looks like this where the absolute value of x is, uh, whether x is negative or positive, the absolute value will always be positive. Uh, and that means that we've got this strange place where x equals 0, which of course is the minimum, uh, where the derivative doesn't really exist. Because if I come in from the left, the derivative seems to be negative 1. If I'm going coming in from the right, the derivative seems to be 1. So there isn't a place at which those actually converge. Instead, we have a discontinuity. But that discontinuity coincides with the location of the minimum which is a bit of a tough one. So we'd rather avoid that situation. Um, then there's case number three, where f of x is unbounded. Um, and this is, uh, the example I gave here was chosen deliberately because it's a polynomial, and you can verify that it actually has um, inflection points. There are places where the derivative equals zero. But on the other hand, the function does eventually go down to negative infinity, which means there is no minimum. Now that happens, that's not a big deal. We do at least want a way of identifying that situation. And then case four. I have two examples of case four because case four is a bit of a strange case. Let's consider this function x squared. That's the best drawing of x squared that I can do. And here we have the line um, where x equals zero. And uh, what if I define this funny function f that's equal to x squared everywhere other than zero, but I make a hole at zero. So, so I, make, I actually deliberately extract the value x equals zero, and I set f to equal one at that point. So I'm allowed to do that. I mean, this is a valid function. It's ridiculous. I have no idea why I'd want such a thing in practice, but it's valid. And if we're talking about optimizing arbitrary functions, I am allowed to engage in this kind of shenanigans. So I do this. And you'll notice that the problem here is that the function can get as close to the value 0 as possible. But at no point does f of x actually equal 0. Because normally, the place where x squared equals 0 is x equals 0. But I've taken that, I've extracted it, um, I've surgically removed it, and I've set it to 1. And so f of x approaches 0 as I get close to x equals 0, but it never actually hits it. Um, this is a problem for a lot of reasons. One, it's, it's ridiculous. I shouldn't be allowed to define such stupid functions for our purposes. But two, suppose you did have to worry about this. Well, maybe you'd use some numerical solver or something. And numerical solvers, of course, have to work inside some tolerance. 
And if I'm, if I'm using some numerical solver and I've got this weird sort of uh, infinitesimal difference between x equals 0 and x equals 0 0.0000001, 000 but there's a massive difference in the values of f, so when f, for a very small value of x, f is going to be close to 0. But when x actually equals 0, then f is going to be equal to 1. That's going to be a bit of a nightmare for numerical stuff. So I want to really avoid that if I can. A more classic example of case number 4 would be e to the x, which is a function that looks sort of like this, although not like that, which gets closer and closer to 0 as I get closer to negative infinity, but never actually hits it. So it's not unbounded. I mean, the function's bounded. It, it's always... Uh, positive. But at no point does it actually ever hit its lower bound, which is something I'd rather avoid for practical optimization. So uh, suppose that I begin imposing restrictions. And I, I've mentioned the point of this lecture is to talk about why it's good to impose restrictions. So suppose that I, I require that my function first be defined for all real numbers. I don't want some weird situation where the function is sort of piecewise and only exists in little pieces here and there, because that can cause all sorts of trouble. Suppose I require that my function is continuously differentiable. That means the function is continuous, and it has a derivative, and that derivative is continuously differentiable as well. So I can go as many layers down in derivatives as I want, and all of them are continuous. That helps me get rid of some of those cases from before. Now I'm down to these two cases. Either the minimum occurs at an inflection point, or the function goes down to negative infinity. OK, so that, that helps a bit. That gets rid of those two problematic cases. But I'm still in this situation where there could be an infinite number of inflection points. If I scroll back, this function here is continuously differentiable and defined for all real numbers. And yet I still have the problem of there being an infinite number of inflection points. So even if I impose that restriction, I'm still in some trouble as far as having clarity for how to compute an answer. And that's not to mention the problems associated with solving nonlinear equations. Let's talk about constrained optimization. So we've seen already that it's a bit of a mess to handle unconstrained optimization even with a function of a single variable. What about if I have a function of a single variable? So f of x is my objective function. So what I'm writing is minimize f of x subject to the constraint that g of x is greater than or equal to 0. So I only want to consider values of f for which the corresponding argument, if I throw it into g, gives me a positive value. So this is a constrained optimization problem. And we usually write it out like this. And I've mentioned in the first lecture that when I say st, we want to read that as such that. But it's not. It's subject to. It's subject to this set of constraints. Now, of course, this is the classic template for a constrained optimization problem, but I'm allowed to have as many other constraints as I want. I'm also allowed to have the inequality be in the other direction. I can actually have an equality symbol. I suppose I could even do something like this, although it's a bit of a nightmare to handle cases like that. Um, this is the typical tableau uh, of a constrained optimization problem. And remember our vocabulary, the thing that we're minimizing or maximizing, that is our objective function. The set of all values of x that meet the constraints, so all candidates to be the minimum, is called the feasible region. So that's the set of all x values, everything in the domain that uh, actually meets, satisfies the constraints that I've set. In this case, it would be the set of all x values such that g of x is greater than or equal to 0. Um, there is nothing that precludes, as we'll see in a minute, there's nothing that precludes the feasible region from being a whole bunch of different disjoint sets merged together. So that is to say, think, uh, suppose I'm working in two dimensions. I could have a feasible region that looks like this, but also includes a piece over here, and they're just completely separate. That is allowed, although we're going to be ramping up pretty quickly to requiring that our feasible region just be a single contiguous region, because it makes a huge mess otherwise, as we'll see in a minute. All right, so here are my, my functions f and g. that I want to minimize f subject to g is greater than or equal to 0. So here's the function g. And g is greater than or equal to 0 between here and here, and then again between here and here. And what that means is that all of these points are irrelevant because g, the constraint is not satisfied. Everything to the left is also irrelevant, and everything over here is irrelevant. The only values for which I care about the value of f, for which I want to minimize the value of f, are the ones in this window and this window, the places where g is greater than or equal to 0. Now I'm going to clean that up because I can um, 
I can show that on a future slide. So we think about it like this. If I'm minimizing f subject to g being greater than or equal to 0, then I'm ignoring every possible value of x where g is not greater than or equal to 0. So my feasible region are just these two pieces here. Um, but before we get to that point, let's just look at f in general. It turns out f has a global minimum. It has an inflection point, a place where this is, so at this point here, f prime of x equals 0. It has a global minimum. And maybe you can believe that, that if this global minimum ha happens to occur inside of our feasible region, then that would be the minimum of the constrained optimization problem. Because clearly you can't get any, if f has a global minimum, you can't minimize f to be any smaller than that. But unfortunately, that global minimum, which is sort of in here somewhere, that is not included in our feasible region. Okay, so what do we do? I want to find the smallest value of f inside of these two pieces, in, inside this feasible region. Maybe it's clear that it seems to be happening sort of over here. And in general, there are two cases. Either the minimum occurs somewhere in the middle, in the interior of the feasible region, so for example, maybe there or something, or the minimum occurs on the boundary. It occurs at a point that divides the feasible region from unfeasible points, or infeasible points. Uh, we shouldn't use the word unfeasible. That turns out that is not a word. Um, so those are our two choices. And then, of course, I guess there's that third option where, for all we know, f could go to negative infinity somewhere in the middle of my feasible region. But it's not happening in this example. Uh, and notice that because I have a constraint greater than or equal to 0, points that are actually on the boundary, so places where g of x equals 0, they are considered to be feasible points. Um, if that wasn't the case, if I had this strict inequality, I would have a sort of nightmare situation in some cases. It would be similar to that case 4 from earlier, the case where uh, there is no the region isn't closed, and as a result, we may never actually attain the minimum that we're, that we're looking for. Um, and so, yeah, the, the slides point that out. So in general, for the constrained problem, we end up with three cases, assuming again that the functions are continuously differentiable, which is actually a pretty strict constraint. Um, so the three cases are either there's no minimum because f of x goes to in negative infinity somewhere in the feasible region. The minimum occurs at a boundary point, a place where g is equal to 0, so on the edge of the feasible region. So it would be here, 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 or here. Uh, or the minimum occurs at some interior point. Uh, and this is a typo. Um, it occurs at some point where g of x is greater than or equal to 0. I guess maybe in this case where it's greater than 0, strictly, and the derivative equals 0. In other words, it, it's a minimum of f that exists independently of the constraint region. It just happens to lie inside the constraint region. OK, it turns out in this case the minimum is over here. It is at this boundary point. x equals this hideous thing. And the way that I would have had to obtain that is I would have to solve the equation g of x equals 0. It's a boundary point. And so on a boundary point where g of x equals 0, I would need to find a value of x that satisfies that equation. Because g of x is a polynomial of degree 4, there could be a lot of places like that. And in fact, that's why we've got this issue of there being um, two disconnected regions um, that comprise the feasible set of points. Okay, so I have to solve that. And of course, that means that I might have to solve polynomial or nonlinear equations um, that have ugly looking solutions. If I want an exact solution, so not some numerical approximation, that can be a bit of a nightmare. And keep in mind, this hopefully to you looks like enough of a nightmare to prove my point. Keep in mind, it's just a polynomial. What if there were trigonometric functions? What if, there, what if I was using exponential functions or logarithms? It would be an enormous mess if I don't want to settle for a numerical approximation. And frankly, even if I did want to settle for a numerical approximation, how do I actually get that solution? Do I use Newton's method? Well, I mean, I, I could try Newton's method, but I would need to know something about derivatives. I would need to understand whether that could converge. I would need to know if the system is ill-conditioned. There's a lot of um, variables that I can't account for necessarily if I'm working with solving nonlinear equations. And we're going to see in this course that you know that's a moot point because we're often uh, obsessed with only getting exact solutions. I don't just want a high uh, precision approximation of where the, the value of x is. I want to know symbolically exactly what value I'm dealing with. And that means if, it, if this is the solution to a um, polynomial of degree 4, maybe it involves a bunch of square roots, which is what's happened here.
And okay, I actually answered my own question. That's why it would be difficult to find the minimum computationally. Especially, so keep in mind, the need to get an exact expression. That's something people often overlook. There are often cases where I cannot settle for numerical approximation. I need to know the exact expression. I need some algebraic representation of my result. Okay, so where does that leave us? This brings us to the end of part two. So um, the optimization problems that we want to work with in this course can involve thousands, thousands of variables, and in many cases, thousands of constraints. We have just been talking about single variable problems. Even if we restrict those problems to having continuously differentiable functions, we still end up with this nightmare of special cases that we have to handle. So first, we uh, have to establish with this constrained problem, just like the unconstrained case, whether or not the objective function is bounded. Does it go to infinity or negative infinity? We have to find the feasible region, which might require solving a bunch of nonlinear equations because the, the constraints could be defined as they were here by nonlinear equations. Um, and there are methods to solve nonlinear equations. In many cases, they're just approximations. But keep in mind, if these were linear functions, we have this enormous uh, body of work on how to solve those. We can use linear algebra to solve linear equations. And then, uh, once we've figured out what our feasible region is, we also have to go looking for these interior points um, that could be minimums, which of course means we have to find the, these inflection points. So that's points where f prime of x equals zero, which again might require solving nonlinear equations. And there could be an infinite number of such points depending on the behavior of the function. And so we can't just write a program to iterate through all of them, even if we have some easy way of enumerating them. Okay, there, fine. So we've talked about constrained and unconstrained optimization in one variable, and we've got lots of reasons to be pessimistic. Let's talk about what happens if we have two variables. Uh, we'll see a few more reasons to be pessimistic about the general case. So I wanna find the global minimum, hopefully we have some appreciation by now of how hard that is, the global minimum of this function of two variables. Okay, so first question, how do we visualize this? If I want to talk about it and draw pictures, how do I visualize it? Okay, so there's a couple of options. You go to a conference or something, you obviously want to pull up some flashy looking 3D visualization like this. People love this stuff. Um, they'll just stare at this. They won't even listen to what you're saying. They'll just stare at this visualization. Um, but maybe it's clear that uh, this isn't going to help us because if I ask questions like, where's the minimum? I think, you know, it looks like there's a bit of a crater here. The minimum is probably somewhere at the bottom of that, but I can't see it because of the 3D visualization. It's so clever that it, it masks off the information that I I want. Um, so what we can do is look at a top-down view. So suppose I have this visualization of the function and I position a camera up here facing directly downwards. Well then I'd be looking at this. And obviously this is a little bit more informative because I can sort of see where the bottom of the craters are, but our human eyes aren't very good at picking out the patterns here because of the sort of continuous nature of the color scheme. So what we tend to do for cases like this is to deliberately sacrifice a bit of detail for the sake of getting uh, more visual cues. Uh, we use what's called a contour plot, which you can think of sort of like a topographic plot. So you can think about, think about looking at a map, um, which is a top-down view that shows where the mountains are. Um, you'd use these contour lines to give a human reader some impression of the topography, of w the altitude of the... Um, of the landscape. And uh, you might uh, have heard these lines that we're drawing, these contour lines, they would be called level curves in other settings. Um, I want to scroll back a bit and talk about this other bit of notation. So in this course, we're going to spend a lot of time working with linear algebra, um, both explicitly and implicitly. Um, and I am a huge fan of using geometry to justify things. You might have noticed that. That's why I like using all of these visualizations. Um, and for the sake of um, not fighting too much with notation, and for all of the things I'm saying today about derivatives and constrained and unconstrained things and well-behaved functions, the big fight in this course will be me versus notation. Because we end up with so many variables and Greek letters and things that it becomes very hard to talk about the subject and make any sense. So often I will use notational shortcuts. I don't think that they're not rigorous, but we, we should talk about them. One big one is any setting where I find myself using a collection of variables, x1 through xn, I will essentially use that interchangeably with this vector called x. Notice the vector notation is boldface on these slides. When I use the vector um, vector x, I am using that interchangeably with a collection of individual scalar variables, x1, x2, up to xn. 
And so just to be clear, we could therefore view this f of vector x, um, where vector x equals the vector x, y, or something. We can view f as taking two scalars or as taking a two element vector, essentially interchangeably, as long as we define the notation that we're using. So we have this contour plot, which allows us to sort of glance at the function and, and understand a little bit about its behavior. For example, if we assume the function is reasonably well behaved, which I think is the case here, so there's no weird surprises where it suddenly spikes to a massive number in the middle of this crater. If we assume that this contour plot is faithful to the real behavior of the function, then we could say, well, it looks as if this is the bottom of a crater, this is the bottom of a crater, and so is this, and so is this. And we know enough to say, well, pretty clearly, because this is a darker blue, pretty clearly this is more likely to be the global minimum of the function. But notice that there are still four distinct places where the function seems to bottom out. Four troughs where, um, if I am standing at the bottom of that crater, I may not realize that I'm not at the global minimum of the function. So the function has four local minima. Okay, first question I guess is how do we find these? So uh, we don't want to make a contour plot. How do we find them mathematically? Uh, and we use something called the gradient. So we want to use the same logic we used in the one dimensional case, which is setting the derivative to zero. The issue is that a function of multiple variables doesn't really have one derivative. We have to generalize the notion of a derivative. And there are a few different generalizations. You've probably seen them in some calculus course. The only one that we care about is something called the gradient. And the gradient is a vector. So if I have a function that is a function of multiple variables, let's get, make up some example here. So here's um, f of x, y, z equals 2x plus x, uh, let's say 6xy plus y minus z. Okay, so there's a function of three variables. And we can think about the derivative of this function, but keep in mind that there are multiple variables. And so if we're talking about the rate of change of the function, we should be talking about like relative to what? Relative to one variable changing, all variables changing in the same way. So because it's a tough question to answer, there are multiple ways of defining the derivative. The one that I care about is something called the gradient. So I say gradient of f, or we, we might say grad f, is a vector. So this is a three variable function, and that means the gradient will have three elements. And each element will be the partial derivative of our original function with respect to one of the variables. So the first element, I'm, actually I'll draw this a bit lower down. The first element of my gradient will be the, um, the derivative of, actually, yeah, I'm gonna change my notation again. I'll, I'll do it all the way over here. So the first element of my gradient will be the derivative of f with respect to the first variable x. The second element will be the derivative of f, the partial derivative, with respect to the variable y, because that's the second variable in the argument list. And then the third element will be the partial derivative of f with respect to the variable z. Okay, so what does that look like? Okay, so if I take the partial derivative of f with respect to x, what I'm doing is treating everything but x as a constant and then taking the derivative with respect to x. Okay, so that would be, the derivative would be 2, 2 times x, so 6 times x times y. Well, everything but x is treated as a constant, so that would be 2 plus 6y. Okay, the second element, and then these two things are constants, and so there's no x term there, so I ignore them. What is the partial derivative, derivative with respect to y? Okay, well, let's see, 6 times x, so I treat everything but y as a constant. 6 times x plus, and then the partial derivative of this with respect to y would be 1. Okay, what's the partial derivative with respect to z? Well, I keep everything but z, I, I treat it as a constant. That means this is irrelevant, this is irrelevant, this is irrelevant, and then z is in, the only term involving z is this one, and it's negative 1. All right, so the gradient of f in this case would be this vector here. So it's a, it's a sequence of partial derivatives, and it is a vector. That is a key thing. And that means we can ask questions. Naturally, we might want to ask questions like, what is the direction or the magnitude of this vector at a particular point x, y, z? Um, one thing you might observe is that if I have a function of only one variable, so we're talking about this case here, if I have a function of only one variable, the gradient of that function will be a vector with one element. In other words, it'll be a scalar. And it turns out that sort of naturally, as we would want to expect, the gradient of a function of one variable is just equal to the usual derivative that we're used to. Uh, 
So the reason we care about the gradient is that at any particular point, and notice how here I'm using uh, boldface x, which means that the point is, I, I, when I say f of x, I mean a particular point uh, x, y, a particular point uh, in, in the domain of f. If I look at the gradient at any point, so I'll choose, a, there's an example up here, but I, I can see it's a little not as visible as I want. Suppose I choose this point here, and I ask, what is the gradient at this point? The geometric interpretation of a gradient is that at each point, the gradient, the direction of the gradient, tells you which direction should you travel for the value of f to increase the fastest. So it's the direction of fastest increase. It's If I'm standing at a particular place on the landscape, the gradient tells me the direction to the higher ground. That's it. Um, and the magnitude of the gradient also has a meaning, but we don't care about it. Frankly, we just care about the direction of the gradient for the sake of this optimization problem. The reason why that's significant is it does sort of imply a way in which if I'm standing anywhere on the landscape, I could improve um, my progress towards finding the minimum. So for example, if I'm standing right at this point here and I ask the question, well, is this a minimum? Or can I find a smaller point? Well, the gradient points towards the higher ground. And it turns out that that means that the negative of the gradient, so if I go in the exact opposite direction, that'll point towards lower ground. And that means I can use the gradient to decide whether there's some way I can improve on my current footing, whether I can get closer to the minimum. And I'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes. So here are some examples of gradients at various other places. So at these four points, the gradients are as given. And notice how they do seem to quite uniformly point out of each crater. So if I'm standing at the edge of one of the craters, the gradient will point me towards the higher ground, which means if I go in the opposite direction of the gradient, I should be going towards the inside of the crater, towards the lowest point. Uh, and it turns out, in fact, that if you reach a point where um, the gradient is actually equal to zero, keeping in mind the gradient is like a type of derivative, and we know from before that when the derivative is zero of a one variable function, you have an inflection point. If you reach a point where the gradient is zero, then you have hit an inflection point of, of your multivariable function. Now, just like a single variable function, that doesn't guarantee that you're at a minimum or a maximum but it does mean that that point is a candidate to be a minimum or maximum. And if it weren't, we would call it a saddle point. So a saddle point is an example of a point that um, is not a minimum or maximum, but where the gradient is zero. And in a higher level setting, so in calculus, when you talked about unconstrained optimization of multivariable functions, you probably talked about what do you do to decide if something is a saddle point or not. Um, and the, you use further derivatives. There are linear algebraic things you do. We don't worry about that. I just want to prove a point about gradients today. So for that function, for sorry, this is actually a new function. For this function here, the gradient is this vector. So it's a function of two variables, x and y. Uh, and if I just sort of, I can associate terms here. So the gradient, this, this would be the uh, partial derivative of f with respect to x. OK, so the derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of y squared with respect to x is irrelevant um, to us. The derivative of this term here with respect to x comes out to be this. Um, and then that's the partial derivative with respect to x. And then I, do the, I can do uh, sort of the same thing, the complementary thing, to get the partial derivative with respect to y. Uh, okay, so what I could do then is I could observe, and actually maybe I didn't make the point I wanted to make here. I, I could observe that if I want to find a point where the gradient equals zero, well, what I'm asking then is I, I would like this to be equal to zero, and I want this to be equal to zero. So 2x minus uh, y plus 1 equals 0, and 2y uh, minus x minus 1 equals 0. And if I stare at that, in fact, actually, if I remove the brackets here, so that would be this, um, then I end up with this. And if I do a little bit more surgery on this, if I move the constants to the right-hand side, we might observe that if I'm looking for a place where the, where the gradient equals 0, what I'm looking for is a solution uh, in terms of the variables x and y to this system of linear equations. Interestingly, because my, my partial derivatives are all linear, I could, for example, fall back on linear algebra. I could just solve this system of linear equations to find a place where the gradient equals 0. Something that, although this is a nonlinear function to start with, because I ended up with something linear, I get a lot of help there. One more reason, one more point in favor of linear uh, functions. 
So I could do that. I could, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna belabor solving the system. It turns out that the solution is x equals one third, y equals negative one third. Uh, and then if we look at that on here, that puts us pretty, uh, I mean, predictably right in the middle of this crater. I can solve it to find that inflection point. Uh, and so it turns out that that is the global minimum of f. Okay, so now what about this? So here's a function whose derivatives are pretty ugly by comparison. So unlike the previous function where the derivatives turned out to be linear, this one, because it obviously contains our friend e, uh, we know that if e appears in the function, e is going to appear in every derivative all the way down. And that means that the gradient of f is also going to involve e. And this is a bit of a problem. Because in our previous example, we were able to um, find a point where the gradient equals zero by solving a system of linear equations, which may not be our favorite thing to do in the world, but is something we do know how to do. We, we have methods to do that. We could use Gaussian elimination, we could use Kramer's rule, there's all sorts of options. We could just sort of stare at it until it made sense. But here, if I want to find a place where this equals zero, suddenly I have to set this equation to be zero and this equation to be zero, and I have to find some way of solving that. I have to find some way of solving a multivariable, nonlinear system of equations. Um, and it turns out even worse, because of the way that E is being used, there actually isn't any way of algebraically expressing the solution. I can make some numerical approximation, but I, I can't easily express the solution algebraically, um, which is a nightmare. It means now I'm forced to do everything numerically, but also that I still have to find some way of solving it. I guess I could try something like Newton's method here, but uh, this is a bit of a nightmare, even though really E isn't that unpleasant of a function. I mean, it has lots of properties that are actually pretty convenient. Unlike trigonometric functions or logarithms or things, using E in something, generally speaking, isn't that big of a deal. And yet if we've done that here, we suddenly have quite a nightmare for solving the optimization problem. So the question then is, uh, what do we do? And I should also observe, if we use a numerical method, I mean, that's, that's fine. We, we can, there are plenty of cases where numerical methods would suffice. We then still need to provide enough information for the method to work. It might require us to give a bunch of, to, to express a bunch of derivatives or something, which we would then have to derive ourselves. We may not have a program that could do that for us. One thing we could do, though, if we wanted to find a place where the gradient equaled zero, instead of explicitly solving equations, we could use an iterative algorithm. And this is a big deal. We're going to come back to this a few times. We don't generally use this in linear programming, but we should know about this. This should be in our toolkit, this application of the gradient. Um, and it's called the method of gradient descent. And it works basically like this. Suppose I choose some random point. And I assume that the function has certain behavior. Uh, one bit of behavior that's very important is that if I'm standing at, some, at the edge of a crater, at the bottom of that same crater is the point that I'm looking for. So suppose that I choose a point and I think it has that property. So I choose this point up here and I look at the gradient. And the gradient points me towards higher ground. What I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, higher ground is up this way. So I'm going to take a little step in the opposite direction and I end up down here. And then I ask the same question. What's the gradient? And the gradient still points towards higher ground. And so I take a few steps in the opposite direction. And that gets me towards lower ground. And then I ask again, what's the gradient? Okay, the gradient points this way. So I take a few steps in the opposite direction. And you might see that if I do that, if I keep deliberately walking away from higher ground, I might eventually get down to the bottom of this crater. And I suppose I would eventually converge at the lowest possible point. But of course, there's then the question, how long does that take? What is my tolerance for convergence? All of those things are difficult to answer, but it is a method that gets me closer to a solution. It allows me to make progress. So we'll try that out with this visualization. So I start with some point x and I compute the gradient. So I'll use the red arrows to show the gradient in this diagram. And then what I do is I essentially, I move in the opposite direction. And the slide is going to talk about why this is a reasonable thing to do. So basically, the gradient of f is the points towards high ground. It is the direction of largest increase. Um, and the reason I'm allowed to walk in the opposite direction is that uh, the, if I walk in the opposite direction of the gradient of f, I'm doing this. I'm walking in the direction of negative gradient of f. But we can observe that negative gradient of f is actually the same as the gradient of negative f, which means that it will be the direction that negative f is increasing the most quickly, which is the same as the direction where f is decreasing the most quickly. So that means if I walk in the opposite direction of the gradient, I am walking um, towards smaller values of f. 
So I try walking uh, a little ways. It, well, I'll do this one first. I try walking uh, in the opposite of the direction of the gradient, and I get to some smaller value of f. Now, the slide that I skipped was pointing out that although, I mean, the gradient says here's the direction towards high ground, here's the direction towards lower ground, it doesn't guarantee you that if you walk in the direction opposite the gradient that you'll always, no matter how far you walk, you'll get to lower ground. I mean, if I walk too far, if I walk all the way over here, then I might be back at higher ground. What the negative gradient tells me is that if I walk a little ways, it doesn't guarantee me how long, but there is some small distance I can walk that is guaranteed to get me to higher or lower ground. And what this slide is saying is just there is some epsilon greater than zero such that if I walk that distance, I'm getting where I want to be. It, there's no guarantee of exactly how long of a distance I'll get. But I walk, I walk as far as I can until I'm not getting to lower ground anymore. And then I start again. I say, okay, now I'm at this point. Take the gradient and walk in the opposite direction. So I walk this way. Okay, and I go, I go over here, um, and then I do the same thing. And we'll notice that as I, I end up sort of converging at the bottom of this crater, and eventually, within some tolerance, if I'm doing this numerically, the algorithm will converge at the minimum that I was looking for. And that will be a point where the gradient of f equals zero. Um, there's one thing I should observe, which we're not going to worry about in this lecture because it's an overview, but you might notice that at each step of this algorithm, I'm walking some strange sort of undetermined distance. Like, how do I know how far to walk in each, in each step? Um, this is what we call the step size for gradient descent. It turns out, actually, that computing the step size is not necessarily easy, computing the best step size. Um, and in some cases, it actually involves solving another optimization problem. So I'm trying to solve a two-dimensional optimization problem here. Finding the step size, in many cases, involves solving a one-dimensional optimization problem at each step. So this algorithm isn't necessarily trivial. Just because the gradient tells me something doesn't mean that I'm home free. So then there's this same problem that's bothering us, uh, which is, OK, I found the bottom of the crater. I found a point where the gradient equals 0. But great, it's a local minimum. How do I know that there isn't some even deeper crater just off the edge of the plot? Like, I, I have no way of knowing that. I know that if I start here and I walk downhill, I will eventually get to the bottom of this crater. I don't necessarily know that I'm at a global minimum. And that's the bane of my existence. And we're going to see, even going into the next lecture and the lecture after that, that finding a minimum isn't actually the biggest problem we have in most cases. It's demonstrating that there isn't some other minimum we haven't seen just over the horizon. Um, so let's try using gradient descent on this example from earlier, the example that has multiple craters, each of which has a different minimum, but only one of which actually has the global minimum. And we'll notice one of the shortcomings of gradient descent. So if I start up here, then I end up working my way down into the bottom of, that, of the crater over on the right. And that is not the global minimum. It's a local minimum. And if I'm standing at the bottom of this crater, I don't see any lower points, but it is not the global minimum. If I start over here, sort of at the top of this ridge, strangely, I still end up at the bottom of the crater on the right. Still not a global minimum. Uh, and we can see the problem is that this is so sensitive to where I start that I can't be guaranteed that I've chosen a good starting point. Now, there are a bunch of heuristics I can try when the use of gradient, I mean, gradient descent is a useful technique and it's widely used. There are a variety of heuristics I can try to maybe as insurance policies against this sort of thing happening, where at least I don't find the same local minimum over and over again if I run it over and over again. Maybe if I find two or three different local minimums, maybe one of them is the one I'm looking for. Um, but gradient descent has this problem. It's a very local search. Uh, I don't even think I have an example, but maybe you could see if I start over here, maybe then I would end up hitting the bottom of the crater that I'm looking for. But that requires me to have some advanced knowledge. It requires me to know that this is the neighborhood that I need to look in to get the thing I want. Okay, fine. That's part three. Let's look at part four. Suppose I want to solve a constrained multivariable minimization problem. And this is a course about solving constrained multivariable minimization problems. The difference is in this course, we don't want anything to do with all this nonlinear stuff. Um, and of course, in this course, we want to solve problems that have a thousand constraints and a thousand variables. But let's look at a problem with two variables and three constraints, and it's nonlinear. Um, so I've got my objective function, which would be this thing. And we can see already the derivative is the gradient is going to be a bit of a nightmare. And then I've got these three constraints. 
And I hope that there is some set of points, some set of x, y points in the plane that satisfies all three of these constraints. But of course, in any optimization problem with constraints, you run the risk that there simply aren't any feasible points, that the feasible region is empty. And that's one of the valid outcomes for an optimization problem. We simply couldn't solve the problem. There were no points that met the constraints. Notice that we're still imposing restrictions here. They're nonlinear functions, but they're all continuously differentiable. So I'm, I'm already working inside of a pretty tightly constrained um, set of options. And even then, it's going to be a bit of a nightmare. So here's the objective function. It's the same objective function we worked with in previous examples. And then here's the constraint region. And it's, you can see it's ridiculous. It, it, it's ugly, it's strangely shaped, and in particular, one thing you ought to notice is that it's full of concavities. It is concave. If I'm standing over here and I look out over what I can see, the world sort of ends if I look to either side. I don't necessarily know if I'm standing at this point here that you know, if I cross this dark territory, I'll end up back in feasible space. I have no way of knowing that. Notice also that if we take a look at these two slides, if we juxtapose them, here's the global minimum of the function. And conveniently, I have excluded it from the feasible region. So it's not available. The, the global minimum will not be the solution to this problem. It is not a feasible point. And then one final thing to observe, the constraint region, the feasible region has been defined as a result of combining three constraints. And you might notice that if you look at the walls of the feasible region, you can sort of break them up into two straight lines, two vertical lines, a sort of gentle parabola, and then what pretty much is obviously a sine wave. And if we go back, we can see, okay, so there's a parabola of some sort, um, there's a sine wave, and then this constraint here, this x squared constraint, if we take it apart, x squared is less than or equal to 9 over 4 if the absolute value of x is less than or equal to 3 over 2. And so it turns out, although this is a nonlinear function, it, it's actually an absolute value in disguise. And so when I say uh, absolute value of x is less than or equal to 3 over 2, that's where I'm getting these two vertical walls. That's, this is going to be x equals negative 3 over 2, and this is going to be x equals 3 over 2, so 1.5. So we can look backwards and see where the walls of our constraint region are coming from. But in any case, we have a really ugly constraint region. And there are a lot of issues with this. And the biggest one is if I'm standing, if I start in the wrong place, if I find a feasible point over here and I try and search locally, I'll probably say, well, okay, I can go down, I can go down, and then, okay, here's the smallest point, here are the smallest values of f that I can find. So I guess the minimum is somewhere over here. If I start up here, I go down. I go down, and then I'd say, okay, yeah, here's the smallest values of f that I can find. So I guess this must be the minimum. And if I'm standing at the bottom of this trough, even though really I'm in the same crater, like inside the, the actual objective function, I'm, I'm at two different sides of the same crater, notice that if I'm standing here, the edge of the world prevents me from seeing that there's something over on the other side that could also be a minimum. And now think about the fact that if my constraints are nonlinear, I could have a constraint region that's being cut up into a million different pieces. And I then have to find a way of searching inside each piece to find the minimum. So uh, I'm still working with um, uh, continuous functions. And uh, so that means that the, the same cases apply as earlier, which is that either the objective function is unbounded, which is not the case, the minimum occurs somewhere strictly on the interior of the feasible region, which is also not the case because the only um, interior minimum that f has is sitting outside the feasible region, or the minimum occurs at some point on the boundary. Um, and because the only place where the gradient is zero is not in the feasible region, then the minimum by process of elimination has to occur at the boundary. Uh, and so it's worth considering the minimum is probably going to be somewhere either on this bit of boundary or on this bit of boundary. It's worth considering that even finding the boundary might be a really tough problem because I've got these three equations and I need to find points that satisfy all of them but meet one of them at equality. That's what it means to be on the boundary. Because, for example, this uh, constraint function runs off sort of like this. There are points that are on that sine function but are not feasible because they're outside of the other constraints. For a point to be on the boundary, it has to satisfy every single constraint equation but hit one or more of those constraint equations at equality. It has to actually be at the limit of one of those constraint equations. 
So I now have to solve a whole bunch of nonlinear equations, which again is a nightmare and, it, and doesn't give me what I want if I don't have algebraic solutions. I may have to use numerical approximations. I don't want to do that, but that might be the only option here. So it turns out that the minimum is, is, is here. It's over on the right. And that's great. Uh, and that means if I start searching from uh, any point around here, I might find it. But if I start searching over here, I won't. I'll find what I think is a minimum, and it turns out it won't be. And I may have no way of knowing that there are other possibilities. Obviously, that is an outcome I would like to avoid. And so if I start a search over on the left, yeah, I end up at, the, at this, this point here, which is not the global minimum of the problem. So again, just to rehash, that's the end of part four. We want to solve massive optimization problems, thousands of variables, thousands of constraints. We want a method that is guaranteed to give us an answer. Maybe there is no solution to the problem. So maybe the function's unbounded. Maybe there are no feasible points. I want a method that tells me what's going on. It says the problem isn't feasible, or it says the problem is feasible, but it's not bounded, or it says the problem is feasible and it's bounded, and here is the solution. I want those to be the only answers it can give, and I want the method to be correct. I don't want there to be this possibility of getting an apparent minimum that turns out to be wrong. Without extra restrictions, and keeping in mind in this example, I, was, I had a bunch of restrictions, like the functions were continuous. Without more restrictions, I can't even manage these requirements on a two-variable function, much less a thousand-variable one. And then consider, even if I could, how long would it take to compute such a thing? Um, some of these functions aren't even easy to, get to compute in general, much less take derivatives or use gradient descent. Um, and so, uh, Without extra restrictions, I'm in some trouble. Now that said, one of the points of this lecture is to show that we are in some trouble with that, but it turns out that all of that tedious work we're going to do later to adapt our problems to be linear, it sort of pales by comparison. Like that, That's easy compared to, to all the problems that come up if we work with nonlinear functions. And so we'll see later that we spend a lot of time taking these apparently nonlinear problems and sort of um, jamming them into a linear setting so that we can use linear techniques. So here is what a list of things I think we really, really need. First, I think we need to have functions that are always differentiable. Because in the previous examples, even though the functions were differentiable, we still had problems. If they weren't differentiable, we'd have all those weird cases from earlier, like what happens if we have the absolute value? What happened? And then similarly, issues like what happens if we have functions like e to the x that um, asymptotically approach something but never hit it. I also want this. I, actually, I should scroll through. So um, requirement one means that we can assume the function is well-behaved. If they're always differentiable, um, it means we don't have to worry about things like uh, strange discontinuities, but we also don't have to worry about weird situations like suppose this is my feasible region and here's the function. And suppose that for some reason the function just isn't defined outside the feasible region. That means if due to some little numerical issue or something, I try and evaluate the function out here, the function doesn't have a value. I obviously don't want to end up in that situation. So I want to be able to say the functions are all well-defined and well-behaved everywhere, even outside the feasible region. Uh, and this does get rid of a lot of the really, really ugly bits of bad behavior that we encounter. Um, it, it turns out, frankly, that we don't actually need this. Like, th there are lots of compromises that we can make to rule to requirement one. Compromises like, hey, the function has to be defined within a certain radius of the feasible region, but not necessarily outside of that. Yeah, we could do that, but that requires us to make up a set of rules and then figure out how they can be followed. Requirement one is a lot more concise, and it and so it turns out, you know, if we just set requirement one, we're saving ourselves a lot of extra lawyering later. Requirement two. I need some way, and I mean the slide says tractable, which is a good point. I need some easy to compute way of deciding if I'm standing at a location that I think is my minimum, is it my minimum? Not just, you know, it looks like I have nowhere else to go. I guess I'm there. I need to know, is it my minimum or not? Um, in this case, it just says whether it's a local minimum is sufficient, but certainly I need that. Ideally, I would like to know whether I'm done, whether I've found the global minimum. Um, 
And so I've mentioned already, if requirement one holds, then actually this is the condition we would normally use. If, if the function is differentiable, then we know that any interior local minimum or maximum uh, will have the gradient equal to zero. It doesn't necessarily tell us how to decide when we're looking at a minimum that shows up on a boundary. So here's a minimum on a boundary. How do I know this is the minimum if the gradient of f doesn't equal zero? And the next lecture will touch on that a little bit. And there's this. If multiple points all seem to be uh, meeting the criteria to be the global minimum or maximum, they all have to form a contiguous region. So I can talk about what this is supposed to mean. So here are three different points. Let's think of a function in two dimensions. Suppose it's the case that all three of these points have the same value for the function, and it's the minimum one. Requirement three is saying if that's the case, every point between them has to also have the same minimum value. In other words, all the minimums have to be grouped together in one contiguous region. So every single point inside this triangle has the same value as these three things. So if they're all tied, everything between them is part of that tie as well. The reason that that's helpful is that that allows us to rule out cases like this, where I'm standing at the bottom of this well, and somewhere nearby there's another well with the same value or maybe even a lower value. Requirement three gets us around that problem. It says it's okay to have two different points that are the minimum as long as there is no hill between them. That's fine. And maybe we can see that that means I'm sort of guaranteed, if, if, you know, if I'm standing here, that there is a line of sight between me and any other minimum that might exist. So if I'm standing on one minimum, I can see all of the other ones. Then there's this. Suppose that I have some way of deciding whether I'm currently standing on a minimum. And the answer is no, I'm not. Well, obviously, I need to find the minimum. That's the point of the optimization problem. I need some way to make progress. So if I, know, if I happen to know that I don't have the real optimal solution, I need some way of making some progress towards it. And we saw with gradient descent that there are options. We can use the gradient of the function. We still have to decide how that applies to boundaries. Um, but we need some convenient way of making a little bit of progress. That doesn't necessarily guarantee that we can find the minimum in a finite number of steps, but it does guarantee that we can at least get closer to the minimum with each step. Uh, and it also, this, I'm talking here about global optimality. So it's not just, if I'm standing at a point that isn't a local minimum, can you find me a local minimum? I want to be able to say, even if I'm standing at a local minimum, tell me whether it's a minimum or not, or tell me how I can get closer to it. That's something that gradient descent doesn't give us. And it's something that we'll really cherish when we see how we can get it out of a linear program. I also want these things. From a computer scientist's point of view, I, I would like to have these things that make it easier to design algorithms to solve my problems. So the first one is, I want to be able to actually differentiate the function. So if we assume that we're writing programs to solve optimization problems, I guess it's logical that you know, the user is somehow providing representation of the function. Do we expect the user to provide every derivative of the function, or do we get that ourselves? So it, it's hard to tell, but we certainly want to be able to obtain the derivative easily. Ideally, we'd like to avoid using numerical approximations. So that is to say, if you give me this function here, then, oh, let's not bother, not f, uh, x, x squared plus uh, 4x. Um, if you give me this function here, I would like it if I could somehow come up with a symbolic representation of the derivative as opposed to just getting the value of the derivative using a numerical approximation for a couple of reasons. One of them is that numerical approximations to derivatives can be problematic in a lot of cases. And another one is that um, there might be some analysis I might be able to do if I have a symbolic representation. There are lots of ways we could obtain this. Keep in mind that the derivative of a linear function is really easy to obtain. But even if I have a nonlinear function, I could use symbolic algebra packages or something to get its derivative. So this is on my wish list, but it is something that is attainable. Um, notice, though, that we generally consider the derivatives of polynomials to be easy to get uh, a symbolic representation of. Um, depending on when you took these courses, there's a 225 assignment that I've given to people before that involves differentiating polynomials with trees. So it, it's something that can be done programmatically and is not considered to be incredibly difficult. Um, ideally, the function itself should, should be represented in some way that makes it easy to evaluate. Maybe easy to analyze, but certainly easy to evaluate. I don't want to have to spend huge amounts of computation time just evaluating my objective function. Additionally, I would like to be able to get other information about the function, not just its derivative, but also, for example, its inverse 
really quickly. And note, of course, that if I'm working with linear functions, then I can use all of the huge body of work on computational linear algebra to get my answers quickly. Not only can I use linear algebra, for example, for things like inverses, but there are lots of computational linear algebra techniques that would allow me to do that quickly. And then finally, this is one I can't be fully specific about. There are some nuances of this we're going to see in future lectures. But what I would like to do is to find an exact solution. I don't just want an approximation that's highly accurate. Maybe that's, significant, maybe that's sufficient in a lot of cases. But I want to be able to design techniques that can give me the absolutely exact solution. So an algebraically precise solution in all cases. And then I can choose a numerical approximation later if I want, but I, I need to have that option. So that is, if the problem has some optimal solution, if it has feasible points and it's bounded, so it doesn't go to infinity, then in a finite number of steps, I can get a representation of the exact solution. So how do I justify that? Well, the difference is this. Suppose this is your numerical solution. So that's, that is an approximation of this, root 2, root 3, root 5. Maybe you can agree that there are lots of systems where the solution could be these numbers, but not actually be root 2, root 3, root 5. It could just be root 2 to this number of digits, and the next few digits are all zeros, or something like that. This accurate approximation doesn't necessarily tell me the same thing about the solution as this symbolic, this algebraic solution. I would like to be able to solve my problems fully algebraically. So it's interesting, the way we're going to get around this is that not necessarily by finding a way of representing square roots symbolically, but by sacrificing enough about what kinds of things we can represent that we don't need them. So if we work with nonlinear functions, like high order polynomials, so polynomials of degree 2 or 3 or 5 or 10 or something, then it's possible that our solution will involve square roots, in which case we need some way of representing square roots exactly, not with a numerical approximation. We could do that. We could use symbolic algebra packages instead of using floating point numbers to solve equations, and then just hope that we have a solver that can work in a reasonable amount of time. Um, however, it's also worth considering that if I have a linear uh, expression, so 6x plus 5y plus 9z, um, and I, I, I write some linear equation like this equals 17, it's interesting to consider the fact that if you have a system of linear equations where every coefficient is a rational number, the solution will also be rational, period. There, you will not need square roots or pi or e unless some of those things showed up in the coefficients. So if we restrict ourselves to problems specified by rational numbers, we can get exact solutions by just using rational numbers. There's no need to worry about how to handle things like square roots. That's a difference between linear and nonlinear programming that we're really going to benefit from. And you'll learn this pretty quickly. You're going to grow to hate me for this, but it turns out in the first few assignments, you often are going to be required to give answers in the form of rational numbers, not um, decimal expansions that are just approximations. So like, it'll be significant that you write something like um, 1 over 7 instead of 0 0.142857 and some stuff. It'll be significant that we get this exact representation of the solution as opposed to just an accurate approximation. And it's worth considering that, yeah, we, there are models where we would get things like square roots or logarithms or whatever symbolically, but one way of getting exact solutions without having to worry about that is constrain our inputs so that they simply can never occur. And if we have our inputs constrained to rational numbers, then the results will always be rational. And we know that we can do rational arithmetic inside a computer. We don't need floating point numbers to do arithmetic using fractions. Now, the word finite, of course, is a bit of a loaded term, because if we're looking for the exact solution, um, you could argue that with a real, with a, a, a theoretical infinite precision floating point number or something, if you just keep running gradient descent for all, of, for all of eternity, you will eventually, you know, at infinity, converge to some exact solution. Uh, okay, so I put the word finite in there to try and insulate against that bizarre claim. Um, we'll revisit that later, because it turns out that um, many of, some of our early trouble with solving linear programs will come down to the idea that maybe our linear programming solver could go around in circles if we're not careful. So we'll re revisit that issue later. Um, 
that's, that's the end of our survey of why nonlinear programming is something we'd rather avoid for the time being. What we're going to do in the next few lectures is build our way up, add more restrictions to the types of functions that we can work with, and watch as each restriction is added at all the extra properties that we get, working towards satisfying this shopping list, getting all of these must-haves, especially being able to get that condition to ask the question, yes or no, is this point a minimum, not just a low Local minimum, is it the global one? Am I done? And if not, where do I go from here? So we will slowly um, uh, narrow down the set of functions that we can work with, and we'll notice that the only real uh, model that gives us everything that we want is when we restrict all of our functions, our objective functions, and our constraints to be strictly uh, linear functions.